So our second panelist, um, David Wright, is a lecturer in classics at Fordham University. His research interests include Augustan poetry, classical reception, and monsters. His current book project examines giants and titans in Greco-Roman literature. And the title of his presentation today is True Gritty, Reclaiming Monsters for the Marginalized. All right, so I'll turn it over to you now, David. Thank you so much, uh, Hunter. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna put a, a, a quick Twitter thread in the chat. It will correspond to one of the points um, in my talk. So when I start talking about that uh, recently uh, infamous uh, Medusa holding the head of Perseus statue, uh, this will be relevant uh, to that. Um, so hopefully that's cool with me throwing that in the chat for now. Um, all right, just let me get my PowerPoint set up. Share screen. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I wanna thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, I, I wanna thank um, uh, all the organizers and, and um, uh, Hunter for, for chairing this panel. Uh, I also want to th thank three people who helped me come up with this this title that I'm pretty happy with. Uh, Zoe Thomas, Amy Fistone, and, and Caitlin Moline. Uh, they're all very helpful in, in getting me to this point, and <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, pretty satisfied with it. Um, so just a quick uh, content warning. Uh, one's just a more, more general, general one. I'll be talking about um, marginalized identities, so uh, in, in sort of all different forms of systemic oppression, so just uh, be aware of that, particularly sexual violence, because I'll be talking about uh, the Medusa myth. So if ever you need to turn, turn, turn your camera off, step away, that's all, that's all cool, all right? Um, so I'll also start by saying this is uh, sort of a work in, in progress. In general, like I, I'm into monsters. Uh, I, I, you know, I do research uh, on them, and uh, as Hunter was saying, I have this book project on um, uh, giants and titans. Uh, but this sort of new gritty side of it uh, came out uh, sort of right around the election. So this is all kind of fresh. I, I've been interested in, in Gritty since he, since he came into our world in 2018. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm still sort of formulating some of the ideas and yeah, I kind of only have like a very general conclusion. So I appreciate any sort of feedback or, or, or just questions, thoughts, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely sort of a work in progress. Um, so basically what I'm grappling with is like, can I use uh, monster theory and classical monsters to understand gritty and and vice versa, and also I can I just understand sort of where we're at in uh, society right now. So you know, kind of a big question. Um, so yeah, so this thing is kind of relates to some of my other work on on monsters generally. I, I work on giants and titans, and uh, more recently I've been looking at using giants and titans to think about uh, the Godzilla uh, film series. And Godzilla will come into this talk. Uh, don't worry. Um, so my plan for this talk is to basically go over monster theory um, and then look at some case studies and sort of culminate with uh, Gritty. Um, so uh, shout out to, to Jen Rea for sort of setting us up uh, earlier with her uh, question to Alicia. Um, so yeah, basically I'll just go over the gist of this, this monster theory, uh, basically started by Jeffrey Cohen uh, in his book. Uh, in 1996, uh, and in, in the intro uh, to this volume, he sort of sets up these seven theses um, for to help us think about monsters. Um, so just to go over them, oops, to go over them briefly. Um, basically, the first thesis: is a monster is a cultural body. It's a reflection of desire, anxiety, or fantasy. And some of us are Latinists here, so we know it comes from Latin word monstrum, which is related to monstrare to show. So it's, it shows something um, about a culture. Um, and a lot of th th that's reflected on the body of, of the monster uh, it, itself. Uh, the monster always escapes, so the mon monster bodies um, are both corporeal, incorporeal, they're sort of always shifting, and that actually will be helpful for looking at my overall, case, my case studies here, because I'm looking at sort of how perceptions of monsters change and how they can actually be reclaimed by people um, who originally the monster was sort of designed to, to, um, to other. Um, 
monsters are often a, har a harbinger of category crisis. Um, so they have this sort of ontological uh, liminality. Um, they threaten the very existence of categories and they often appear in a time of crisis. Um, and then they sort of return, they often live on the margins of the world and they return at the end of that crisis. Um, so in general, monsters resist categor categorization. Um, a monster is uh, a difference, so they're a cultural, racial, economic, or, or sexual difference. Um, it's manifested uh, in a monster. Um, and um, like, for example, I'll be talking about Scylla and with Scylla, you like Scylla as this, uh, as an example of a, of a, a female character who oversteps the, their bounds and then they're sort of monstrified uh, because of that. Um, so fifth thesis is that the monsters police the borders of the possible. So they often sort of function as a sort of warning, um, uh, the, the, this, this figure of warning and that will sort of relate to um, Oh, I, I talk about Godzilla too. So the, 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 the sort of warning about uh, nu nuclear holocaust, um, and uh, also the monster is a kind of desire, and it's just sort of a, a fantasy of aggression, domination, uh, and inversion. And that's actually, actually will sort of correspond well to to Kate's talk because uh, this often leads to the exoticization of, of foreign lands, as um, she, she was pointing out with the ori Orientalism and with Egyptian monsters in, in games. Uh, so thanks for that, Kate. Um, and uh, sort of finally, the, the monster that's at the threshold of becoming, and here I'll, well, so, so basically the, the monster bears uh, self-knowledge. So I'll quote Cohen here. So they ask us to reevaluate our cultural assumptions about race, gender, sexuality, our perception of difference, our to tolerance towards expression. They ask us why we created them. So that's sort of the gist of this, and then we'll see how this applies to different monsters from the classical world, and uh, then to, to Gritty. So um, some of you are classicists here, so otherwise we'll be familiar with the ones I'll be looking at for these case studies, uh, the Minotaur, Scylla, uh, Medusa, and uh, the Cyclops. So let's look at the Cyclops. Um, Cyclops is often sort of seen as a symbol of uh, the foreign other. This goes back pretty far. I mean, if you look at the Odyssey, um, he does things that are pretty different from the way Odysseus, or Odysseus casts him as being doing things that are very different in the way than the, the typical Greek, if I could use Greek very loosely there, does. And actually, I just wanted to give a shout out to Jackie Murray. She's got a great article coming out where she's looking at racecraft uh, in the Odyssey. So um, it's in a edited volume, I think edited by Denise Fakoski. Um, and that's it's it's pretty cool. Um, but that's most of you probably that's pretty obvious uh, just seeing Cyclops as four and other. Uh, Scylla, um, she can be seen as sort of the fear of the um, the feminine uh, feminine other. Um, you sort of see like basically like with the position of of, of the dogs and sort of this patriarchal fear of of um, of, of feminine power. Um, then we have uh, Medusa. Uh, also, she's a, she's a like a form of a, a, a expression of the fear of feminine other. Also, with her case, um, we have the, the, the victim blaming um, in the case of, of sexual assault. So, if you know the story, of Medusa, she's raped. Uh, Poseidon uh, rapes her in the temple of Athena, and Athena, uh, being the terrible feminist that she is, uh, blames uh, Medusa for it, and then and then she's uh, transformed. Um, Minotaur, uh, yeah, this one I, I didn't actually, I, I just want to use it for a, a, a later, rec looking at a later reclamation of the Minotaur, um, but I haven't looked into in general what, what scholars have said about like what T represents and If I was to sort of just go on vibes alone <laughs> and just throwing monster theory at him, I would say something like, you know, anxiety about animalistic aspects of uh, humankind, uh, maybe get, bring some gender in there. I know uh, Kai Merkley later is going to be talking about the Minotaur, reception of the Minotaur and toxic masculinity, but I could sort of see that in the original, uh, quote unquote, original myth uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, watch out for uh, Kai's talk. Um, and then also the hundred handers. Um, these are interesting monsters from the, the Greco-Roman world. And here I have an image. I, I can't find an image of the hundred handers in from the classical world in, in an art in any way. And if any of you have any, I'd love to see them. So I just picked one uh, from the image of one from the blood of Zeus. Technically, the giants here, but giants and titans are kind of all thrown in the same category. Um, so also looking forward to uh, the, the, the panel later on, on blood of Zeus. Um, but I think they're interesting because they're kind of, they're othered 
because uh, they're, they're, they're these hybrid creatures or multi-form creatures. Um, but they're on the side of, uh, of Zeus in the, in the Hesiodic version, at least. But actually, there are different versions where sometimes they're on the side of the giants and titans in that sort of epic battle uh, of the, the, the Titanomachy slash Gigantomachy. Um, they become symbols of disorder and civil unrest, which is interesting. Then, like, if there's symbols of disorder and unrest, why are they on Zeus' side sometimes? But that may be a discussion for another time. Uh, also, there are earthborn monsters, so they're, they're born of Gaia, and uh, often they're connected uh, with sort of uh, non elites. Um, this idea of people who, do who don't have uh, a special lineage are, are born from the earth. So, I want you to keep that in mind, too, because that will matter for a later reception. Um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, reclaiming monsters. And this sort of makes sense is like, since monsters are sort of a cultural body, their meaning can change uh, as culture shifts. Um, and because they are sort of a reflection of us, we can kind of make them mean what we want them to mean. Um, so even in the, in the ancient world, we have this, we have examples of monsters sort of being reclaimed or at least monsters becoming more sympathetic. And that actually sort of corresponds to my current book project when I look at the giants and titans, because they are kind of othered very much in early representations, but they kind of become less othered as, as, as time goes on. Um, but uh, so we, we can sort of see with the Cyclops in Homer, he's this, you know, other og ogre, but he gets more sympathetic uh, with time, for example, in Theocritus's uh, Idols. He's sort of this lovelorn uh, shepherd, still kind of scary in some ways, um, but he definitely uh, does seem uh, less vicious. Um, so Scylla, uh, so obviously she's this human eating monster in the Odyssey, very scary, um, but with time she becomes a sort of symbol of protection of South Italy. Um, we have examples, see, we see her on coins and, and vases. Um, in the fourth and third century CE. And then particularly uh, during the uh, triumphal period in Rome. So if you know Sextus Pompey, um, it's funny how the, the ancient sources, which are all pro-Augustine tend to sort of cast him very negatively. Oh, that pirate, uh, he's, he's terrible. Um, he wasn't really a threat to Octavian. If you kind of read between the lines, it does seem like Sextus Pompey was a huge threat uh, to, uh, to Octavian. And we're lucky that we have some of his coins here. And I have one of his coins here on the left. Um, so here we have an image of, of Scylla and Sexus Pompey basically took, took him up um, as a symbol of, of his cause. And you can easily sort of see Sexus Pompey as in some ways he responds to Augustus's or Octavian's claim of Pietas where he says, no, actually I'm the real one who's fighting for my father. <laughs> Cause my father, you know, he, my, my father was actually, you know, uh, I'm, I'm actually the son of uh, someone who was fighting for the Republic here. Um, and uh, one scholar I'm following, uh, Jennifer Garish, I don't have the citations at the end of, of the presentation. She sees basically these coins as a response to uh, Octavian attempting to other sexist Pompey as, oh, that, that pirate down there who's like a Scylla. And then Pompey's like, well, no, actually, I am a Scylla and you should be afraid of me. <laughs> um, so I think that, that, that's, that's kind of an interesting theory and that might correspond well uh, with Gritty. Um, and even more recently, if any of you read Madeline Miller's uh, Circe, I think she takes an interesting look uh, with reclaiming monsters in general, because Circe herself is sort of this mistress uh, of monsters. And she, you know, out of sort of misogyny, she um, turns Sylvan into a monster. But her brother, A.T., has interesting comment like, well, maybe you made her better. And the implication meaning like, well, now she's free from the constraints of, of patriarchy in this new monster form. Um, so I think that's another example of that. Um, so uh, the Minotaur, um, it seems like we love to, to reclaim him and, and sympathize him. Um, there's that short story by Borges where we get the whole story from um, the Minotaur's perspective and actually like he's using older sources. The Minotaur has a name, his name is Asterian and we could probably see maybe the, the seeds of this earlier. I have an image of, of baby Minotaur, uh, so cute. Um, so we see this, this sympathizing with him um, and it seems like he, he really becomes a, a queer icon. Um, in, in the more modern uh, era. And uh, there's a book uh, from 2000, The Minotaur Takes a Cigarette Break, and it's basically the Minotaur living in South Carolina, and he's, he's, kind of, he's a short order cook in a steak restaurant, and he kind of has this, this very sad life, but it's very very sympathetic portrayal uh, of him. And he is queer in that book. And actually, definitely check out uh, Liz Gloin's book, um, Tracking Classical Monsters, where she treats a lot of these redemptive uh, 
presentations of um, of the Minotaur. And it makes sense that he might be accepted in the queer community because um, people of queer identities have been sort of marginalized, cast as monsters um, by by society. And it's an interesting sort of form of reclaiming that and empowering reclaiming uh, of that. Um, so let's talk about Medusa. Uh, she tends to get reclaimed a lot. And I feel like we can't not talk about uh, the, the, the the statue of recent fame. And actually it's, it's, it's kind of, it's 12 years old, um, but it was recently placed in a park across from a courthouse in lower Manhattan. So the Medusa with the head of Perseus uh, by Luciano Garbati, an Argentinian uh, artist of Italian descent. So check out that thread that I put in there um, because in some ways it could, could be sort of seen like since uh, Medusa is a rape survivor, this is sort of be seen as like her, as a response to that of her, her getting justice. Uh, there's a lot of problems uh, with the thread and um, uh, Izzy Levy does a great job um, of um, sort of talking about the problems of like mainly the sort of the, 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 the sexual, sexualization of Medusa and um, her basically be, being given uh, characteristics that are typical of uh, white women. Um, so it is sort of like a, um, is an over, overly feminized sort of put to a, a European standard um, uh, Medusa. And it's sort of like just, um, it's, um, this doesn't quite fit it just speaks to a tradition of uh, vilifying women uh, who are survivors who don't fit the ideal. Um, There's this type of ideal here. Um, uh, if you want better receptions of Medusa, more empowering ones, Liz Gloin again has a great uh, catalog of them uh, in in um, in her book. Uh, so the hundred handers um, figures near and dear to me. Um, so I talked about how they sort of can be associated with people of a like, quote unquote lower class, uh, non elites. And here we have a, a image, political cartoon from a 19th century, 19th century British magazine Puck. And there, I read this as a positive uh, presentation of them sort of fighting yes, fighting back against capital. So the sort of this. Um, image of, yeah, labor fighting back, people uniting and, and fighting back against the common oppressor. Um, just I, I throw Godzilla in here because I, I just didn't work on Godzilla too. Um, and if you if you know the Godzilla film series, he is, um, you know, it's, it, it often gets sort of cast as, oh, those silly movies, the guy over suit, but um, they have some pretty serious themes to them. Um, the original, uh, so, and thank you, Bob, for setting this one up. Uh, so it's an allegory for a nuclear holocaust and the military aggression of the United States where Godzilla represents uh, that. Um, but then it's really how he, he sort of shifts too, where he shifts from like oppressor to he becomes a symbol of Japan itself and a protector of Japan and, and the world from, from outside monsters so that we see that sort of shift going as well. And then very recently, bringing back to monsters being claimed by people with queer identities. Um, the, the trans artist, uh, Cressa Beers, adopts Godzilla and Godzilla's child as a symbol of, of trans pride. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about Gritty. Some, some of you, he's been, a lot, he's been in the media a lot lately, so most of you probably have an idea uh, of who he is, um, or, they, or they are, his, his gender is disputed. Um, so yeah, he's the mascot for the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, he came about in, about, uh, 2018, um, uh, and to sort of much derision when he was first unveiled, people generally were unhappy. People in Philadelphia uh, were unhappy. They thought he just looked weird and creepy. But then once people outside of Philadelphia started critiquing him, then people in Philadelphia got really protective of him, uh, which is you know, pretty, very, very Philadelphia. I'm not from, I'm from Scranton. I'm not from Philadelphia, but you know, I'm like kind of close. But yeah, I feel like I can't speak for all Philadelphians. Um, so, so that's sort of like the official version, but the, on the website itself for the Flyers, he has a very sort of monsters uh, origin story where he apparently he was like living under the, uh, in, the in the bowels of the Wells Fargo Center, uh, and he was unearthed uh, by constructions. Um, and also interesting, he's the son of a uh, son of a bully. I'm not sure what that means, but that's sort of part of the thing. This thing, and he kind of has his own sort of uh, bullying aspects uh, uh, to him. Um, so that's sort of how we started. And then once people started really uh, ragging on him, then Philadelphia uh, sort of took him up. And yeah, I, I'm happy to sort of cite uh, this 
this thread from from classics Twitter here for, for, with some class many classics we know we have Kate right here um, for explaining he kind of becomes this this symbol of this this, this genius of Philadelphia and here there's a great meme made by uh, classicist Alice uh, Sharpless uh, as well so he goes from the yeah, derided uh, monster to sort of protector of the city of Philadelphia. Um, and then he sort of moves in the, in the political direction. And I guess this is sort of like how memes and monsters are kind of similar, where it's easy to sort of project uh, what you want onto them, but particularly uh, the left in America took up Gritty and particularly um, anti-fascist groups. Um, so he has this energy that we call fuck around and, 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 and find out, which is actually very Philly. And then it's sort of uh, adopted by, uh, by people on the left to sort of in response to like, yeah, you don't want to mess around with uh, the rise of fascism uh, in our country. And he kind of becomes the general symbol of freedom, uh, equity, um, uh, liberty. Um, so then, yeah, so fast forward uh, not too long ago, uh, he, he sort of was in the spotlight again um, with uh, Pennsylvania being uh, very important uh, in this recent election. Uh, particularly Philadelphia and the suburbs outside. And he sort of becomes a sort of perfect opponent uh, for Donald Trump. And this actually taps into a lot of uh, tropes about monsters too. So in addition to those theses, is also like one of the, the patterns with it is that the hero and the monster. So the hero is like supposed to vanquish the monster. There, there are parallels and uh, Fontaine Rose and Ogden ha have done studies of this too. Like for example, like um, you have a hero who often has some sort of firepower, like say Zeus has, uh, the lightning bolt, he fights Typhon, who's a, a serpentine monster, um, and, and uh, Typhon shoots fire, so you have like fire versus fire, so we kind of have this, this trope popping up again. Um, and he's kind of become this interesting, he's a, a, a god of chaos, so he's both a god, but a, 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 a chaos god, and if we're talking about sort of monsters are sort of reflection of our anxieties or our desires, we're living in a chaotic time, and does, does that sort of uh, make the most sense. And I think it's kind of interesting when you look at uh, other figures from the classical world who are sort of seen as figures of unrest. So like you also see, she's in addition to sort of as being a symbol of Sicily. Also, she's because of, you know, she's uh, a figure of, of different body parts. She is often seen as a symbol of like a, um, a state uh, divided. Um, is there something about this idea of positive chaos that's, that's appealing to us? And yes, I just want to give a, a credit to uh, another Ames person here, Caitlin Moline. Uh, for this meme down here on, on the bottom left. Um, so yeah, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of like uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing with this. So I'll, I'll just kind of ref up here. But like, I think it's interesting that Gritty follows these patterns that we see with, with, with some classical monsters of, of, of him being sort of uh, reclaimed uh, in a sense and didn't know how monsters are used as sort of to other people, um, but also they can be reclaimed as this sort of um, protector type type figures. Also I'll throw in too, if you want to bring gender sexuality too into it. Uh, he's also become um, a, a, an icon of gender fluidity uh, as well. I think the official like Flyers website says, use the pronouns uh, he, his, but other people have said, oh, actually now he's they, them. Uh, so I think it's interesting. But one thing I'll point out too is he's kind of become this anti-capitalist monster, uh, but he's cre creative by corporate interests. But I guess there's an example too of sometimes like, you know, corporate America can be repurposed uh, for, for other means. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll sort of wrap up with just, I don't quite have a official conclusion, but I just I think these patterns are interesting to follow. And in some way they do find it reciprocal too, or like looking at these classical monsters kind of helps me understand Gritty. And uh, also uh, sometimes looking at Gritty, I kind of also understand like Sexist Pompey uh, reappropriating Scylla for his own purposes. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, thank you all for listening.